people think, oh, it's silly. You don't need to be friends with yourself. Oh, but you do. Think about the things you say to yourself in your own head all day Mm -hmm. long. Are you kind? Are you affirming? Are you encouraging to yourself? Or do you beat yourself up all day long? Mm. And that relationship that you have with yourself tends to really affect your relationship with other people. It's definitely going to affect your relationship with your spouse. It affects your relationship with God. Welcome to The Brave Place, where we journey into the lives of brave men and women who have beat the odds or who are in the trenches right now. Difference makers who have truly discovered the warrior that lives within and are living it out. This is the place that will inspire, encourage, enlighten, and challenge that brave person that lives deep down within all of us. Welcome back to another episode of The Brave Place. I'm your host, Christy Rodriguez, and I am hanging out with a therapist today. Brandy Harris is joining us. She's a licensed professional counselor and marriage and family therapist, and she is awesome. And we are talking about something that I think the church tries to avoid sometimes or maybe sends mixed messages to believers and our culture. We're going to be talking about sex. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so we're going to venture down this road. Listener discretion definitely advise. This is an adult conversation. So if you have little ears in the car with you or wherever you are, you may want to tune into us later or ask them to go do something else. <laughs> so Brandy, thank you for hanging out with us today at the brave place. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Well, you wrote this workbook. It's called The Truth About Holy Sex, a workbook for people who love Jesus and want to love sex. (laughs) And this takes a lot of guts to go down this road and you get really transparent and raw, which is what I love, which is why I wanted to have you on The Brave Place, because I think so many topics we fail to address in the church. First of all, I want to just ask you, um, you are a, a counselor and a family and marriage therapist. So, uh, why, why this book? What, what inspired this? Yeah. So I see a lot of families and individuals in my office. And what I was finding was that I would have couples come in and they wanted information. I should say couples and individuals come in wanting information about sex or just voicing discontent and confusion or just lack of knowledge. (laughs) And what would happen is I would do what I could to help them. I found myself saying the same things over and over again. And sometimes they would ask for resources and I had nothing to give them. I found that a lot of the resources that are out there are skewed one direction or another, and they're just insufficient. They're not complete. You know, we may have a great resource that has some really interesting, helpful science, um, but then that book may not support or have any scripture reference or ideas of faith in it. Um, And then I might have a very religious book or spiritual book that's trying to address scripture, but then they really lack in the science area or it's very biased and not good biblical scholarship. So So you wanted to blend, you want to bring the Bible with science together, Yes, which I love. And um, one thing you say is that sex is the only topic that gets an entire book of the Bible to itself. (laughs) And, and it illustrates good sex, right? Yes. So talking about song of Solomon and, and I love that you mentioned that and you said, God is not grossed out, surprised by, or scared of any elements of sexuality. He created them. And so you really take this honest approach and then your goal behind this workbook is what? My goal is that is my goal is always healing. Um, I want people to be able to recover from pain that they've experienced and I want them to be able to grow in a healthy way. So Most people have um, wounds that need to be addressed and need to be healed. And so I want them to be able to do that healing work. And then once you're healthy, I want to be able to grow from there. I want to launch into something bigger or better or more more deeply satisfying. Um, Lifelong, you know, lifelong development for that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you willing to go down this road because not many people want to. And I would say, and and tell me if I'm wrong here, but one of the main cornerstones in any marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's always going to be a part because sex, and I'm sure we'll get into this later, but sex isn't just intercourse. Mm -hmm. It's about intimacy. It's about connection. And that includes the whole person. And so if you don't have sex, 
going well in the marriage. That's not the only thing that's wrong. There are, there's a lot going on there that needs to be addressed, but sex sometimes is a litmus test. It tells us, man, if this isn't going well, there's probably some other things happening. And so how can we address the whole experience of marriage? Mm -hmm. And one thing too, this book isn't just about husbands and wives. No. This is about your individual sexual wholeness. And so a person who does not have a partner in any way, I think it's very important to work through this book because it it truly is about um, achieving sexual wholeness, realizing, you know, who you truly are to the core, because that will play out in other aspects of your life and not just in the sexual piece. Yeah, I I think of a lot of the development that happens um, through the workbook is that you're sorting through wounds that you've experienced um, as a person. And, and sometimes those are specifically erotic. Um, but sometimes, for example, if you have a case, and this is true for most women, most women have some experience with sexual assault, even if it's not intercourse or rape. Um, they've had an experience where they've been touched in a way that was uncomfortable for them and that they didn't want, Mm -hmm. um, but they, they didn't know how or couldn't protect themselves from that, or it happened very quickly. You know, that most women have at least one experience where they have felt that unwanted touch. And, and that's the case for a lot of men as well. Working through what happened in that moment. Um, and this isn't like a deep trauma book. It's not. Um, but if you have those little wounds, you start to develop messages in your head. Like for example, my body is only for the pleasure of other people. Mm. And that messes with you. Mm -hmm. You take that into every experience that you have. If, if the person who touched you was a male, you very quickly can spin that into all men are like this mm-hmm. and all men aren't like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it just messes with your assumptions and, or, or you may have absorbed something from culture that says, for example, um, women's desires are less important than men's desires. Mm. And if that's the case, you better believe you take that into every room you walk into, Mm. every meeting, every friendship, um, and learning how to figure out what those messages were that you absorbed and then learning how to live differently than that is healing for you personally, but then it absolutely affects how you connect with someone sexually. Um, and honestly, how you connect with yourself sexually, Mm -hmm. knowing yourself, feeling good about your own body, listening to your own body. And I'll tell you this, this is a little bit of a detour, but I, I feel like this is significant. I've found such a correlation between the way that we deal with our bodies in terms of health and the way that we deal with our bodies in terms of sexuality. So you've got people who shut themselves down sexually and then in their, in their emotional and in their eating life, they shut themselves down physically and emotionally because of that belief or thing that happened to them that told them they needed to silence what was happening inside of them. Wow. And they no longer listen. Like mm-hmm. when they're hungry, they tell their body, shut up body. I'm not hungry mm. or I I don't need to eat or what's wrong with you that you're hungry again, instead of saying I'm hungry because I'm hungry because my body needs nutrition Mm -hmm. and I need to find something to eat. How can I lovingly and kindly take care of my body? Well, if you've believed for a long time that you need to tell that body to shut up and not listen to the cues it's telling you, then you practice that in every category of your life. Wow. Adding to that, you mentioned in your book, uh, painful experiences, and you list 48 examples of painful experiences. So um, example, I get mad at my partner because they won't have sex with me, or I cannot trust myself because my sexual drive is high. My partner just wants my body. They don't really want me. I can't talk about this with anybody and definitely not with anyone at church. I feel so alone and hurt. I cry after sex because it's so frustratingly unsatisfying. Our sex is not good anymore. Ever since we got married, Uh, there's all kinds of just normal reactions that people have that people never mention. They always internalize it and don't want anybody to know about it. And they stay stuck. 
And so that's one thing you do is you work through a lot of that. But uh, what I'm hearing a lot here is the more we discover who we are and address the pain, the more that's going to play out throughout our lives and certainly spill into our sexual life. Right. And uh, would you say that if you have a sexually whole person, female, sexually whole person, male, they're married, if they are both at just their optimal sexual wholeness within themselves, personally, individually, would you say that creates probably one of the most fulfilling experiences one could ever have in their life? Um, I do think that is a very fulfilling experience. Mm -hmm. I do think it's very powerful. And I also think it can be very healing in itself mm-hmm. to be able to connect so deeply and so honestly with someone. Mm-hmm. How, how can a sexual relationship be healing? Like in the context of marriage, husband, wife, how can that be healing in someone's life? Give me a little yeah. example of that. So I think about a time when, for example, perhaps I've absorbed some sort of message that I'm too much. This is, I hear this from a lot of people. I feel like I'm too much. Mm-hmm. And in a sexual experience where you've been telling yourself forever, I'm too much, I'm too much, I'm too much, I'm too much. And you finally get to the place and you think, I think that I can believe that I'm not too much long enough to risk letting my partner see something or hear me say something that I feel scared about that they're, I I'm afraid that they're going to respond with, Oh my gosh, you're too much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I've come to a place where I've been honest with myself and transparent enough and I've I've found some healing enough that I can then show this person that I'm with this scary thing about who I am or this mm-hmm. very vulnerable thing about who I am. Maybe it's some form of eroticism. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's some fantasy that you've had in mm-hmm. your mind. Um, when you reveal that and then your partner responds with, Oh, this is exciting, actually. Instead of responding with, oh, you're too much. Mm-hmm. You go, oh, my gosh, I'm not too much. I am actually great. Like mm-hmm. this thing about me that was so precious and deeply inside and a beautiful thing that I was afraid was too much. Now my partner not only sees it and doesn't stomp out of the room, but is excited about it Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. engages with me about it and Mm -hmm. finds that beautiful and fun about me, Mm -hmm. then that healing happens. I can believe it a little bit more that Mm. I'm not too much. And and what I'm hearing there too, is just the word intimacy, you know, um, the definition of intimacy to be fully known, Mm. right. And, and know others in that way. Would you say those kind of conversations and that kind of stuff needs to take place before the actual sexual physical piece is played out because it truly is all encompassing. And really before the intercourse, it's about getting to know someone on the deepest levels. Right. And then the actual physical piece is icing on the cake and it enhances um, the emotional piece that has taken place prior to that. Right. Yeah. I I like to say, and you may hear this if you talk to another sex therapist, intercourse doesn't create intimacy. It's an avenue for intimacy So if you haven't built intimacy around the relationship, then the intercourse itself is actually not going to be very satisfying. So we have to build it all around the intercourse before the intercourse. And then when the intercourse happens, there is increased intimacy or an increased flow of intimacy, if that's how you want to say it. mm -hmm. Um, But the truth is we can practice building intimacy because intimacy is bigger than intercourse. Mm -hmm. You can practice building intimacy in every relationship that you have with your friends, with God. I even would say with yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a big push in the book to, to talk about your relationship with yourself. Um, Because you think about, people think, oh, it's silly. You don't need to be friends with yourself. Oh, but you do. Think about the things you say to yourself in your own head all day mm-hmm. long. Yeah. Are you kind? Are you affirming? Are you encouraging to yourself? Or do you beat yourself up all day long? Mm. And that relationship that you have with yourself tends to really affect your relationship with other people. It's definitely going to affect your relationship with your spouse. It affects your relationship with God. All, all of those avenues for intimacy need to be cared for in order in order for every single one of them to be enhanced and to be good. Mm, that's so good. 
Well, what'd you say, um, that our culture has it backwards. We do the physical first and expect this emotional intimacy. There's one thing you mention. You say our consumer mentalities encourage us to gobble up and then throw away romantic partners like fast food. And that, that comment made me think, yeah, it's because we have it backwards. We, we go to the sexual piece first and it's not fulfilling or satisfying right? because we're lacking the emotional piece that was supposed to come first. Yeah. I grew up in, I would call the hookup culture, mm. you know, where relationships were <laughs> sex and intercourse first and then build the relationship afterwards if there was sexual compatibility and that tends to not work it just doesn't work that way we have to be able to connect and get to know one another in a more whole person kind of way and then the sex or the intercourse can be very very fulfilling but it's okay to get to know someone in a whole lot of ways without the sexual piece or I should say without the intercourse piece, because there are some sexual dynamics that tend to happen between people before they get married. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to do the, the nothing, 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 everything the day after the marriage, it, it, that doesn't go very well. I mean, I, I can be really honest about that. That does not go well when it's off up until the last day and then on the very next day. There's got to be a, a figuring out the process beforehand. And of course, that's a very prayerful thing that has to happen and a very careful thing that needs to happen. And I don't think that that um, every expression of sexual behavior is appropriate before marriage. I don't think that, but there has to be some kind of figuring out because we can't, it's not an on off switch. It's a development. So otherwise, and I, I suppose you could have a couple who wanted to do this. Um, you know, if you're wanting to just begin physical, sexual, figuring it out the day after the marriage, you shouldn't be expecting to have intercourse quickly. <laughs> mm. It's going to be a long time before that's actually a satisfying, joyful experience. Mm -hmm. So one thing that you, you talked about, and we've been talking a little bit about the, just the emotional piece to intimacy and why that's so crucial and important. You mentioned emotional childhood, emotional adolescence and emotional adulthood. So unpack those areas about how those relate to our emotional health. Yeah, that's so good. Okay. So this is something I teach in my office all the time. Um, so emotional childhood is natural codependence that happens at the beginning of every relationship. It's this experience of seeing yourself as an extension of the other person because of your similarities. So if you think about a young child, a literal young child, you know, little girl might want to paint her nails because mom paints her nails and little boy wants to wear a baseball cap because his dad's wearing a baseball cap. That child is just demonstrating the natural codependency and overemphasizing their similarities with their parents mm -hmm. because that's a safety mechanism. Mm -hmm. So I, identifying with that parent yes. makes them feel safe. Like, yeah. yes. Okay. Because if I, I, I mean, it's amazing what we know implicitly this, no one ever teaches us this, but babies pop out of the womb knowing that if I look like these people, they are going to bond with me and they're going to more likely protect me. That's just true. We mm. more naturally protect people who look exactly like us. It's just a brain function. Wow. Also with emotional childhood, we are emphasizing togetherness. We're doing a whole lot of togetherness because that's part of bond building. It's the initial bond building. So that codependency is just in us. When we first meet someone and we're trying to build a bond, we tend to overemphasize similarities. Oh, you like that? Oh, I like that too. Oh, you, you know, and I, I have a, a, an adolescent daughter and, and she's demonstrating this to me all the time in her young relationship with her boyfriend. You know, they, they want to like trade sweatshirts all the time and they listen to the same music and right, you right. Know, they've got these things that are exactly alike. And it's because the relationship is young. And I remember doing that too, you know, mm -hmm. with a, with a young mm -hmm. boyfriend. Oh my gosh, we're so much alike, you know, mm -hmm. um, Emotional adolescence is when you are starting to realize, actually, I'm not just like you and actually I'm really not like you. And I'm going to, I'm going to overemphasize our differences. And for a lot of relationships, that's actually a breakup point. Um, mm -hmm. If they don't know how to process all the way through, they're like, you know what? We're too different. We have to be done. You can see this in an, in, in a literal 
adolescent child, they start overemphasizing differences from their parents, right? Oh, you listen to classical music. I hate that. I want country music or right. rock music or whatever the thing is. Um, or you like brown hair. Well, guess what? I like green, you know, and, and they're, it can look like a rebellion, um, but it's it's very much overemphasizing the differences because you're trying to develop a sense of separateness. So with emotional adolescence, the thing that you're learning is separateness. So we've learned togetherness as a child. Now we're learning separateness. And this is all like a natural progression in a healthy dynamic, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, what if you have an emotional childhood experience where you don't have that togetherness and you are not experiencing the similarities and you're feeling uh, different, rejected, that sort of thing? What about what happens there? Yeah. So there's a wound there. Um, there's a wound when that happens, when, when there's not a chance to build that sameness feeling. Um, there's a wound that kind of sends the message that you're always going to be separate and you're always going to be different and you're never going to be able to be together. Um, and that, that is exactly something you can take to counseling and say, counselor, I want to work like on this. Mm -hmm. This is the thing. I have never felt like I was actually a part of the group. Mm. I've always felt like I was on the outside mm -hmm. and you work through that with your therapist. Mm -hmm. Um, the emotional, adolescence, if that doesn't happen, if you don't ever get the separateness, then what you get is a huge fear of being separate. Like what if I like something different? Well, then I'm just going to pretend like I don't, mm. I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay silent. I'm going to stay quiet. I'm never going to voice that I actually don't want to do that. Or I actually don't like that. And I may even, I may even be so good at squashing that in myself that I don't even recognize it. I don't even know. Mm -hmm. I don't even know that I don't like it because I've never asked myself the question because I've not allowed myself to be any different than the other person. This, I see this in marriages a lot where one partner, and it, it isn't always female or always male. It's, it just depends on the couple where one partner has completely shut down their individuality and they just behave just like the other person. They mm. act like everything, everything that their partner likes is what they like. Well, th that's what we do because that's what he likes or that's what she likes. So that's what we do. And that's not satisfying. It's, mm -hmm. it's not enjoyable because mm -hmm. both people are not being themselves. Mm. And that's a big thing with this book. You know, I, I had, I have a several therapist friends that I've, you know, launched the book two and four. Um, and they, asked me the question, what if I have a couple coming in where one person is really wanting sex to get better and pushing for that? And the other partner is just totally against it. If I give them this book, am I just enabling that really unhealthy dynamic where the picture is one of the partners is sexual and the other partner is not? Is that just going to reinforce the sexual partner's drive and bullying of their non-sexual partner? And I said, actually, no. The goal is that if you are the partner with higher drive, you need to figure out your work and be really okay with your partner being different from you. Mm. You need to be able to calm down mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and learn how to take care of yourself and your intimacy needs. And that doesn't mean necessarily going out and find another sexual partner, but mm -hmm. how do you be okay? How do you be okay with your connections and your feelings of being known? And then there are there other ways that you can love and respect and care for your spouse mm -hmm. that that allows them to be right where they are, mm -hmm. um, without feeling bullied or pressured by you. Um, and then it also gives permission to the other spouse to develop at their own pace to figure out what's going on with them, not just to hurry up so they can have more sex, but how do I figure out what's going on and wh why am I so resistant? You know, it, it's, it's probably not that you just don't like sex. You know, I've had people ask, well, isn't asexuality a thing? I'm like, yeah, but it's really, really rare. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Most people's sexuality who's shut down have just had some really terrible experiences that they don't know how to work through. And so they can't open up to that because it doesn't feel safe to them. And mm. we've got to dig into why the why not just shame it or turn it into a, a sin thing or a right and wrong, but a why is there resistance? There's resistance for a reason. It's actually rational resistance when you've had the experiences that they've had. So mm -hmm. back to your question about um, emotional adulthood. So I described emotional childhood as 
hyper em- emphasis on similarities. Yeah, togetherness. Yes. Emotional adolescence is hyper focused on differences mm-hmm. or separateness. Mm-hmm. Emotional adulthood mm-hmm. is being able to be similar and different from your partner, to be able to recognize both of those things, and to be able to be both separate and together. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of freedom there. Mm-hmm. We're separate. We have our we have our clear domains, what we're responsible for. We don't get to say things like, you made me mad. We get to say, I got really angry when you said that. That's really different language. Mm-hmm. When you mm-hmm. take it apart, it's not this blaming the other person. Right. I did this, but I have a right to do this because you did that. It's not that. It's I responded in this way. And yeah, you know, you something you said or did kind of affected me, but I have to own my behavior. Right. You're you're owning those thoughts and feelings. Yes. My behavior, my words, my needs, even I'm responsible for my needs. I can, I can come to you and I can ask in a very respectful way for what I want from you, but you have a right to tell me no. And I have a responsibility to take care of myself in a kind, respectful way. If you tell me no, and it's, it's not that we should always be telling each other no, but Mm -hmm. we should be able to tell each other no, Mm -hmm. because that makes our, our yeses free yeses. We get to joyfully choose one another instead of practicing ball and chain, which is what a lot of couples do. Right. It just reiterates the importance of really going back and taking a look at your childhood and where things were on or off with that and being willing to do that because it truly affects everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think we underestimate that. So many people naturally just want to say, okay, that was back then. I'm over it. I have to move on with my life. It was a terrible experience or no, I was not close to my, my mom or my dad, or I had this awful thing happen to me, but that's in the past. And I'm not going to let that affect the rest of my life. And, and it does not have to affect the rest of your life. Right. But you do have to go back and look at that to see how that affected you internally so that you can live out the rest of your life in a more whole healthy way. I really appreciate you emphasizing just the importance of that emotional childhood, Mm -hmm. emotional adolescence, emotional adulthood, and even the healthy look of as an adult, you can say we are similar here, but we're also different here. And I accept all those parts Yeah, and how important that is. And how, how fun, I mean, to find things that you have in common is fun. It's a lot of fun to be like, you like that. I like that too. But I would say it's interesting to be different. Yeah. You know, we're learning how to explore new territories because we're different. Our whole world gets bigger because we're different Mm. and we can go into adventures we never would have gone on on our own. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we're together and we trust that person, we're getting to experience way more than we would have been able to experience on our own. Which um, builds intimacy Mm -hmm. on on a whole nother level. And and that brings me to this word. it's you mentioned in your book differentiated. Mm -hmm. And so help me understand a little bit about differentiated, what you mean by that? Yeah. So that, that description that I gave you a little bit earlier about emotional adulthood, that is a good description of differentiated. When we are differentiated, we are separate, very clearly separately defined, unique people but we are together. We're doing the work to connect with one another. And I also like, I like the example of Brussels sprouts. This just makes a lot of sense to me. So you got your house. I love Brussels sprouts, but I don't like being around them when they're being cooked. Okay. They do not smell good. (laughs) So if you invite me over to have Brussels sprouts at your house, which by the way, that would never happen (laughs) because I can't handle Brussels sprouts, but we're going to pretend I'm having a really, you know, differentiated type day where I want it to be open to being different from, or being alike, I guess is the word. So yes. anyway, go, okay, okay, go okay. for it. So you agree to make these Brussels sprouts for me. And, and I say, great, but I'm not going to come over until you're finished cooking them. So we're separate. You live in your house. I live in my house. It's okay that I stay at my house until it's time for dinner. Mm-hmm. Um, you do the cooking, the 
we're pretending the smell doesn't bother you, okay. you know, whatever yeah. you, you can handle it just fine. You do mm-hmm. that thing. You take responsibility for cooking. Mm-hmm. You're excited about mm-hmm. sharing with me, mm-hmm. but you just understand that the process doesn't work for me. So you're, you're doing what you need to do. And then when you're done cooking, you say, Hey, want to come over? And I'm like, I, I sniff the air. Are we okay? Is it better? Um, and I, and I'm like, okay, it's good now. And then I come over and we get to have Brussels sprouts together. And then I go back to my house and have something different that I want to cook for you and you come to my house later we are separate we're separate uh-huh. but we figured out how to be together in our separateness okay i love that no and that's so important right that's that's allowing the individual to be him or herself mm-hmm. but also experience togetherness at the same time yeah it's so good and one thing i want to talk about is the words prudent vulnerability Okay. So explain to me what you mean by that. When I hear the word prudent, it feels like a negative connotation to me. Right. So, so tell me about prudent vulnerability. Right. So when I was a kid, girls got called prude mm-hmm. when they wouldn't kiss the boys. Right. So right. it was a, it was a, a put down. I know that's an old term, but it was something that you said to someone that you were criticizing them, really trying to pressure them into doing something that they didn't want to do. So I always thought that prude was a bad a bad word or yeah. something I didn't want to be because I got criticized by my my peers. But the Bible very much values prudence. And when I think about prudence as just being like stuffy or haughty or refusing to let people in, it sounds very negative, but that's not the way the Bible uses it. The word prudent in the Bible means appropriately withheld. It's anticipating and wanting what is better in the long term Mm. more than what's quick and immediate and easy right now. Mm. And so when we practice prudence in our speech, in our sexuality, in our, in our emotional connections, what we're doing is thinking about the long-term goal and being slow to develop in order to have the best long-term goal rather than the quick, maybe very pleasurable short-term goal. Okay. Oh, that's really good. Okay. And then vulnerability is the idea of being open or allowing someone to see you in a very raw form. And this is a very hard thing to learn how to do appropriately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) So I would say that vulnerability by itself isn't necessarily good, but vulnerability practiced prudently is very, very good. So I remember actually watching a, listening to another podcast where they were talking about vulnerability on um, the internet, for example, where you go on Facebook and you rant about um, the really terrible things that are happening between you and another person. Mm -hmm. That's not really practicing healthy, safe vulnerability. That's just kind of putting all your junk on a billboard and letting everybody see it. Yeah. That doesn't really, it doesn't. You do, you're not going to find connection with people through that. Right. And you're not going to find intimacy through that. Real vulnerability is is kind of like we described earlier, that idea of risking the parts of yourself that you're not sure are lovable. Um, maybe you believe it in a tiny way or maybe you believe it in a philosophical way. You know, mm-hmm. well, I know God made me and that I'm pretty sure he loves all the parts of me. So maybe he loves this ugly, weird part of me mm-hmm. too, but I'm not really confident about that. And then I risk telling you about that. I'm like, you know what, Christy, I have this one thing I've been thinking about and I'm, I feel kind of weird about it or I'm feeling kind of scared about it or gross or nasty. Mm-hmm. I, I just don't know how anyone else in the world would feel about this piece of me, but I'm having a hard time loving myself about it. Yeah. Can I share that with you? Mm-hmm. And that feels like such a risk. Like I can even feel a lump coming in my throat talking about it. Like, Mm -hmm. am I going to let you see that? Right. Me very gently and openly holding that out to you because I've vetted you as a safe person is me practicing vulnerability. And the hope is that you catch it. You know, you say, oh, thank you so much for sharing that with me. Thank you for letting me see that part of yourself that is so delicate and beautiful that I know you don't share with everyone. Mm-hmm. It's precious to me. It's good. Mm-hmm. If you catch that my vulnerability like that, that's when we've begun to develop intimacy. Mm. That's where the prudent part comes in as far as making sure you have a safe person. Yes. And then you have to bring in the vulnerability when those things come together that will build the intimacy. Okay. Yeah. I would say, you know, with the safety piece, Vulnerability is never entirely safe. 
Mm -hmm. There's always a risk to it. Sure. So it's not, I I don't think actually you can vet people to the point of perfection. You're never going to be guaranteed that someone's going to catch your most precious thing that you hand with that Mm -hmm. to them. And spouses often miss those little vulnerable shares and they Mm -hmm. don't quite catch them. and, And then we have to do some repair work. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. It's just learning, okay, how do I do it in a safe way? Mm -hmm. How do I secure the relationship? What work can we do to make sure that this is safe or make it as safe as it can be Mm -hmm. before we make those risks? And is there also a piece too, before you go into that risk of having an understanding too, that this person's response to me does not determine my own value? Mm -hmm. Because to me, that would be my responsibility walking into a vulnerable, if I'm, if I'm getting ready to be vulnerable, I also need to own the fact that their outcome does not determine my value. It doesn't mean that what I'm thinking or about to express is invalid or not um, true to me. Right. Right. You know, I I feel like there's that that needs to be owned a little bit. Absolutely. And and if it's not, then you are kind of setting yourself up for potential disaster. Right. If if you're not getting the affirmation, if you immediately go to, well, it's because I'm not worth affirming. You mm-hmm. know, if someone doesn't treat me respectably, then I'm not respectable. That's not true. I mean, right. I, I, I guarantee I am a respectable person in my household most of the time. Let's give me at least a 75% here. Yeah. But I guarantee that my children are not respectful to me 100% of the time. Right they sometimes are very disrespectful and that's mm-hmm. about them right having a problem right then about me deserving their respect and that's mm-hmm. true in every form you know it, we talked earlier about that kind of um that belief i'm too much mm-hmm. um i may be actually too much for a particular person in yeah. a particular moment yeah but that doesn't mean that i'm too much yeah it just means that the context didn't work Right. So walking in, being able to say, I hope this is a good context. I really believe that I am not too much. I realize that I might actually be too much for them in this moment, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try and let them see a part of me and hope that they catch it. And we're, we're stepping out in the faith, Mm -hmm. in the, in the hope that Mm -hmm. they can catch us Yeah, and that we can begin to build intimacy. And that that's my part is to show up and to be open their part is, is their part. They right. have to do their work in order to be ready to catch intimacy or catch vulnerability for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but my job is to be open. And then, and then the reverse, right? Like I, I should be doing my work so that I'm ready to catch the vulnerability of other people as well. Yeah. No, I, I feel that that's just crazy important. Um, but what I've done in the past is made them a God in my life in that way, like an idol in that way where their opinions, their thoughts, all of that determine a lot about who I am personally, where if I go into that place, I really need to know who I am, what I feel and that's okay. And it, and it is enough in, in that yeah. sense, Yeah, you know? So one thing that you mentioned that definitely plays a role in our sexuality, um, even besides the emotional, pieces that we talked about childhood, adolescent and adulthood is our culture and the patriarchy that exists within our culture and how that plays out in our sexual experiences, our relationships and all of that. So I know for me, this has played a big role, Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways. And again, when we're talking about sexual relationships, it's not just about the sexual piece. We're talking about our sexuality and we're talking about relationships and friendships, mother, daughter, mother, son, for all of this, like it is our sexuality it plays out in all of these relationships. It's not this physical act of sex all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where we miss it a lot of times. And so patriarchy, can you talk to me a little bit about that and explain how that really does play a role and how we communicate in a sexual way individually and in our relationships? Sure. Yeah. I think this is a good one to define. A lot of people think when they hear the word patriarchy, they think of the man. You know, mm-hmm. if you've heard people reference the man, mm-hmm. um, but the man is not a man. And let's clarify that the man is this idea that the largest, loudest, most powerful group is worth more 
than the quieter, smaller group in the margins. It's worth more. That's yes. that's the idea. Yes. Okay. That's the idea. So yeah. every time policies are made in any organization or relationship where the louder, dominant, more powerful person is served and the person in the margin who is quieter and smaller and weaker is not served, that's an illustration of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So, and we do this, we do this all the time. It's in us. It's a part of our culture. It's practiced in every organization. I know there's some element of patriarchy there that we have to pay attention to and realize what's happening. It's not by the way, the way God operates, Mm -hmm. but it is the way our culture operates. Mm -hmm. So and that that's just the the sin of man, right? It's like ego, it's power, dominance, yes. all of that. Yes, absolutely. The pride. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I can get what I want. Yes. It's that selfish piece. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you see patriarchy affecting the church and men and women relationships and carrying over into the sexual aspect of marriage? Oh, okay. Great question. You're going to have to keep me on track to not okay. make that was, this podcast that was a loaded last one, I know. three hours. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, So for one, we do have historically the American church, um, has a, has a male dominated experience. Uh Um, and so male voices are heard a lot more than Uh female voices. Uh Um, and I would also say that white voices are heard Uh a lot more than people of color. Uh Um, and so because we have a lot of other people in the church besides white men, Uh (laughs) we still have a lot of work that we need to do so that we can hear everyone who's in the congregation, Uh everyone who's in the body. And, you know, it, it, I really, I'm not against someone being in charge. I think it's okay that only one person holds the microphone on Sunday morning. Um, There is a way to be a great, powerful leader that serves and cares for everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because one person has the microphone doesn't mean that 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 person is domineering. Um, It just means that they do have a dominant voice and they're going to have to work pretty hard to know what's going on with everyone who doesn't have a loud voice. They're going to have to listen intentionally. And I, I don't think we're doing great with that. In terms of biblical scholarship, I think there's a case to be made that for primarily male elders. But if that's the case, there should also be work done to make sure that the female voice is heard by the male elders. And I don't know that it is Mm. every time. Mm -hmm. I think we need to do a better job of inviting other people who are not in that room to speak and to speak into issues that affect a whole body of people. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the one I see. So how does that play out in sexuality and what message have we sent our men in the church and the message we've sent women? Yeah. So the message that most women absorb, or that this is the message I hear the most often from women. In, in your therapy chair. Yes. In okay. my therapy chair and mm-hmm. my friends. My friends are very open with me as well. Yeah. Um, the thing that I hear often is that sex is supposed to be male centered. That's the message they absorbed. Mm. And no one ever said those direct words from the pulpit. But because so many experiences are male centered, the assumption is that sex will be male centered as well. Mm. They're basing their engagement on his drive, on his desire and on his pleasure. And those things for women are not noticed or paid attention to, mm-hmm. they're not listened to, they're not sought out. And mm. so women sometimes are very resentful, but oftentimes they're just really sad, mm. just really sad. And, yeah. and, or they don't even know the answers to those questions themselves. They don't know what they desire. Mm-hmm. They don't know what they think. They don't know how they feel. Or if they do feel those things, they feel very sad and resentful towards their partner, which is really unfair because sometimes their partner had no chance of even knowing that they were different than them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I see that one a lot where, where women just haven't used their own voice in their marriage to say, I would rather we do this, or can we do this instead first? Or is it okay if we do this? Or they feel like they're too much. They feel like, mm-hmm. um, 
they feel like they're going to wreck their marriage or that it's somehow unfair for them to ask for what they want, or Mm -hmm. they have no idea how to use their words Mm -hmm. to express what they want from their partner. Mm -hmm. And then men, um, now of course there are a few men out there who are cruelly demanding that sexuality remain, his sexuality remains the primary focus of the, of the right sexual experience. Mm -hmm. But what I've seen is honestly a lot more men who they just think that's how it's supposed to be because that's what they've always been taught, but they don't actually enjoy it. Mm. They would, maybe there, a lot of times what happens is that their wives are showing up with their bodies, but not with their hearts and their minds. Mm. And so it's, it's like having just a body on the bed mm-hmm. there with you. Yeah. And men really do want that. They want yeah. the heart and they the mind the of the woman. woman. Yeah. Yes. They want the whole person. Mm-hmm. And so they want the whole person and they want their whole personhood to mm-hmm. be experienced and enjoyed. They want to be known just as much as women want to be known. Who are you? What do you like? What do you want? How do you feel? Mm-hmm. Now, typically now, now those questions, don't you feel like our, the church just really just is terrible. At, at telling men, hey, get to know your wife, ask her these questions, explore her, what she wants. This is about her. And then telling the woman, this is about him, explore what he mm-hmm. wants. Isn't that truly how it's supposed to work out? Yes. We should be doing so much more to know each other in a holistic way mm-hmm. rather than to just make sex a priority. And I think that some couples say, Let's make sexual intercourse a priority. A lot of couples do that. We're going to do this because we know it's good for our marriage or or maybe they say because we know it's good for him. Um, but what they don't realize is that we need to really make knowing each other a priority. Yeah, that's the number one. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like I need to know you and you need to know me in a holistic way, all of who we are, not just bump together every other night or whatever it is that we've decided is how we're going to prioritize that. Right. And and in my mind, there's an intimacy waiting there on the other side that so many people do not understand or value, especially men, because I don't think that they're taught that, you know, they're not taught that, look, there is such a beautiful reward on the other side of this that is way more than the physical reward and Mm -hmm. it's so worth it. And I think if most men knew the value and the beauty in that, like if they could just experience just a little bit, they would not hesitate to pursue that emotional connection. Because I, I think I've seen men and in, in couples that, that I personally know that they get that. And so that's truly their number one pursuit now. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you early in the marriage, it was more about the physical for them. And then they started understanding weight, there's an emotional piece here that I truly need as a man too. And that I want. And once they started getting that and pursuing that in their spouse, now it's flipped. They pursue that over the physical. And now the physical is even better than it was in the initial piece. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I want to push this because I think sometimes this gets missed. It's not that the physical isn't important, right? The physical is important. And I, I think about even the, even the pieces of non-erotic touch mm-hmm. are so important. You know, being able to be affectionate and kind and gentle with one another and warm and loving. There are a lot of people that don't know how to do that mm-hmm. or don't practice that regularly. Mm-hmm. But loving each other with our bodies is very, very important. Mm-hmm. It's not that we just need to talk more. We do need to talk more. Yeah. But we need to learn how to touch each other in loving ways besides just intercourse. So good. And really quickly, you know, just we've been talking about the importance of the emotional intimacy and obviously the physical intimacy that um, goes along with that. Now, what if you have a spouse completely avoiding sexuality or sexual intercourse, sexual anything with you? Mm -hmm. Um, What are the harmful effects of that and what needs to take place? Yeah, that's a really complicated question because the last thing I want to do is add more pressure Mm -hmm. in that marriage. So let me talk about it from both positions. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're the spouse who is wanting the sex and your your spouse is not engaging with you, um, it is really important that you do some work personally so that you can be okay 
and not be overly tempted to connect with someone outside of your marriage. Mm -hmm. That's your responsibility. Yeah. Um, You are still responsible for remaining faithful. Mm. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you figure out how to care for yourself um, by connecting with God, by connecting with your people probably by connecting with a therapist as well, Mm -hmm. finding ways to support and care for probably the loneliness that you're feeling and maybe even the neglect that you're feeling. Um, Those are very painful experiences to feel disconnected from your spouse sexually. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is not at all any kind of excuse to bully or pressure or force or be hateful mm-hmm. to your spouse mm-hmm. um, because they're not engaging with you. You can give them feedback. Mm-hmm. You can let them know that you're sad about that and that maybe even that you're feeling the loneliness. Mm-hmm. Um, but you you don't get to be a jerk. You don't get to push your mm-hmm. spouse when mm-hmm. they're very clearly struggling and suffering with something themselves. It can be very demoralizing. You mentioned yeah. that in your book, whenever you are rejected in that way yeah. and super painful. Yeah. So again, we're not saying that you don't talk about it with anyone, address it and really take a look at, Hey, these, this is some really hard stuff to walk through when you're married to someone and they're rejecting you and don't want anything to do with you in that way. There's something major going on with them. Yes. So realize that pray for them have that acceptance and understanding, um, but also love yourself well by addressing your own pain through yes. that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I think sometimes it's, we do a bad job of just shaming the spouse who has higher drive. Um, and there is nothing wrong with a high, high sexual drive. Mm-hmm. It's actually really good mm-hmm. and beautiful and something that God designed in mm-hmm. order to connect us. So like you said, acknowledge with compassion, what your spouse may be going through that you may be not be party to at all. Mm -hmm. You may have no idea and be completely shut out from that experience because they're not ready to share it with you. Mm -hmm. And, and there may even be some selfishness there. I'll even give that. Sometimes that is a piece of it. Sure. But it never gives you the right to force or pressure your your partner. You do need care, though, because it, it it's not an unreasonable expectation that you will have sex with your spouse. Right. That's a reasonable right. expectation. That's, that's a healthy expectation. Yes. yes. Everyone I know who got married expected that that would be a part yeah. of their experience. Yeah, so that's what differentiates a friendship versus a marriage. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Something different reasonably was expected to happen there. So when it doesn't, of course you're wrecked. And of course there's a lot of pain and disappointment and there's a lot to work through. And it is a real, a real mm, grief that you have to process in order Mm -hmm. to be okay. And even in the long run, I I don't think that's okay long-term. So then the other partner, if we're, if we're, if we've got a partner, I'm going to speak as if I'm the woman who is in a place where I just don't want any sex at all. Um, and, and by the way, absolutely. There are men who find themselves in this position as well. It's not just a female experience, but if I, as a person am finding myself not interested or willing at all to connect with my spouse in a sexual way, I, I think the first thing I have to do is ask myself why, what is going on? And instead of assuming sin, because I think that's often a a Christian struggle is to say, well, it's because I'm bad or I'm wrong or I'm broken or I am messed up or I, you know, instead of starting in that self judgment kind of place, Mm -hmm. ask yourself the question, why am I rationally so resistant to this? And how can I find some healing? Mm -hmm. Because I know that this is a good thing that God designed. I know that he put it inside of marriage and he wanted that to be a good thing here for me, but I'm, I'm pushing against it. Why? What is really going on? You know, are there some wounds that I have? Are, are there some experiences that I have? Um, maybe even just asking yourself, what is it that I need? Mm. What would I need in order to want connection with that person? And just start with that. And sometimes the answer to that question is not like some erotic answer. It's not that I need us to play out this fantasy that he won't do or something like that. Sometimes it's just, you know what? I am so flipping exhausted. I have been you know, awake 20 hours a day for the past three years because of small children. Yeah. And what I really need is to figure out how to rest because I emotionally and mentally just can't prepare myself for 
this vulnerable, transparent interaction because I'm so exhausted and depleted. Mm. You never know. Everyone is a little bit different from this. Maybe I do have some trauma I need to work through. Mm. Maybe I am, am practicing over busyness in a lot of other areas of my life. What are the things that I would actually need in order to want to engage and, and learn how to take care of those needs so that you can eventually engage. Mm -hmm. And again, that goes back to your individual self dealing with your own stuff first, but also being willing to talk about it. Don't just stay in silence in the same place in your marriage because you'll just stay stuck until you do break the silence. And if you don't break the silence, welcome to being stuck. Yeah. I mean, that that's honestly, and that happens yeah. so many times. It just gets worse. Yeah. It, it will get worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And, um, that wedge between the two will just continue to grow. And unless someone does have the courage to speak up and start addressing those things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to wrap this up. You've been so informative and I'm so grateful, Brandy, that you came to hang with us. And for anyone that is wanting to take this journey into discovering the truth about holy sex. And there's so much hope in this book because of all the questions that you address and allow people to walk through and really face about themselves to reach that individual sexual wholeness so that it will play out and really impact your marriage, but not just about marriage individually in all your relationships. It's just so important. And I just appreciate this so much. You have a website. Yes. So tell our listeners about where they can find you. Yes. So my website is it takes a breath.com has all of my, all of my materials there. I, I'm a regular blogger, so it's a once a week blog. It's more diverse than just this workbook, but you can follow that. It's sometimes really fun, sometimes informative as well. It takes a breath.com. Okay. And if you could say any final words to someone who is struggling to find sexual healing and wholeness, what would you say? Yeah, I would, I would just say, maybe we go back to the name of your podcast. Mm. Um, the brave place. Mm. I, I just think anyone who is ready and willing to do this work is practicing their bravery. And I am, I'm proud of them without even knowing them that they would be willing to do this hard work. And I'd love to do anything I can to support you figuring mm -hmm. it out. And it would be absolutely worth it. Brandy Harris, the truth about holy sex. And again, this is not about just married couples. This is for everybody. Mm -hmm restoring your sexual wholeness so that it, you can live the most fulfilling life possible that God wants for you. Thank you, Brandy, so much for being here. You're welcome. And that wraps up another episode of The Brave Place. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. If you have any questions about anything or a topic that you would like us to discuss on The Brave Place, you can email me, Christy at KLRC.com or Christy at TheBravePlace.org. And Christy is spelled C-H-R-I-S-T-Y. And until next time, have a brave day. Thanks for listening to The Brave Place, part of the KLRC Podcast Network.